Too bad the identity of the killer in today's movie isn't a bigger mystery. It could have been a great who done it. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling McKelly Suave's classic slasher flick, Stage Fright. If you're having deja vu with this video, congrats. That means you're an old school Sick Flicks fan. I covered Stage Fright in like my third video on this channel, and I had no idea what I was doing. That video is really more of a traditional review of the film than a Sick Flicks video. And because I love Stage Fright, I decided it was time to give it the proper Sick Flicks treatment. I plan to do the same with The Beyond at some point too. Both movies deserve better videos. I hope you'll indulge me. Anyway, released in 1987, Stage Fright was Suave's directorial debut. What should have been a by the numbers stock and kill flick becomes something much more interesting in Suave's hands. Years spent doing second unit work for Dario Argento clearly influenced the actor turned filmmaker. Stage Fright offers up a cool killer, a creepy locale, and stylish visuals, but can it deliver enough splatter to earn an encore performance? Let's get to the gore and find out! Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Ethan Jantz, Ren Hayes, and Brutus Sean Brown. If you'd like to sponsor some videos, sign up for my Patreon. Links in the pinned comment and description below. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on the credits, and I like that this movie isn't wasting any time. And we've got yet another John Morgan sighting. John Morgan, aka Giovanni Lombardo Radice, aka the hardest dying man in Italian horror cinema. What terrible fate will befall him today? Screenplay by Lou Cooper, which sorta sounds like Luigi Montefiore, I guess. And music by Simon Boswell. That's almost as good to see a music by Goblin. Directed by Michele Suave. After years of acting and second unit work for Dario Argento, Suave finally gets his big break. In a film written by Luigi Montefiore and produced by Joe D'Amato. That hardly seems fair. With the credits over, we jump into the movie, where this kitten is catting around. <laughs> Meow. And speaking of kittens catting around, I'm not sure if this is a wig or the head of a mop. This is the worst Liza Minnelli cosplay ever. Too bad for her, her smoke break is cut short when someone reaches out to touch her. <laughs> then the Boswell kicks in and the streak comes to life. And this guy comes flying out of the alley like a bat out of hell. Or an owl out of hell. What a hoot. And then everyone starts dancing. Wait a minute, is this Street Trash the musical? Sesame Street sure has gotten dark since it moved to HBO. Anyway, look at that choreography. It's clear this owl isn't just winging it. Man, that was pretty owlful even for me. And I really dig the Suave pullback shot here. This movie really gives you an early look at how talented he is as a filmmaker. And now everyone's dancing. It's a real free for Al. I hope you're ready for all these bird puns. And just because this shit wasn't random enough, here's Budget Marilyn Monroe with a sax solo. <laughs> just insert your own Marilyn Monroe is good at blowing joke here. Back on stage, the locals are getting frisky. Our killer's like, I got Al dressed up for this. I'll give Suave this, it takes balls to open a slasher film with a dance sequence. Last time this happened it was Night Killer, we all know how that turned out. Too bad our director isn't impressed. The erotic angle. You call that erotic? That was about as erotic as watching my grandparents make out. Now hey look, it's Giovanni Lombardo Radice. How will he die? Place your bets now. Paul Sorvino here has notes on the production. I don't see what the business about the victim seducing the killer has to do with anything. Budget David Byrne is like, Jesus, everyone's a critic. I'm here to protect my investors, not your precious career. Wait, is this a dramatic recreation of a conversation between Suave and Joe D'Amato on the set? In case it slipped your mind, this show opens in just one week from now. And as you can see, those people up there literally stink. Well, I'm glad we're all in agreement on this being terrible, at least. It stinks! Backstage, Sybil's calling her agent. Can you get me out of this? I thought Budget David Byrne would be a lot nicer. This seems like a good time to meet more of our cast. Here's Brett fulfilling our quota for flamboyantly gay theater stereotypes. Batching, honey. You can always go back to microwaving chili at Mexico Joe's. And here's Laurel. And you can go back to selling your asses in the men's room at the bus station, darling. Sick burn. Then we hop over here, where Sybil is telling the Wish.com version of Sting that she's pregnant. It's positive, Danny. Christ. He's like, don't stand so close to me. Back out front, rehearsal continues. I'm no Broadway critic, but this show looks pretty staged. Back inside, Alicia has messed up the simplest advice for actors. She hasn't broken a leg, she's just twisted an ankle. 
was your anger? It's killing me. You really shouldn't be working at all, you know? <laughs> nice work, Alicia. They're gonna sneak out to see the doctor, but they need Budget Danny Glover here to open the door. I'm too old for this shit. Meanwhile, over in another movie, we get to see what might have been had Michele Suave made a Jaws ripoff. Not gonna lie, still looks better than Deep Blood. If you're wondering why we're focused on Sheila Goldberg's name tag, it's because she's the co-writer of this film. She worked on the dialogue. And in another room, this guy's trying to break out like he's Swing Out Sister. Okay, real talk. I never thought in a million years I'd reference Swing Out Sister on this show. But here we are. Also, do you kids even remember Swing Out Sister? Christ, I'm old. And it turns out our psycho is Alicia's biggest fan. Brave Clarice. You will let me know when those lambs stop screaming, won't you? And now it's time for the doctor to deliver his exposition diagnosis. I just saw a middle door with bars. Who's in there? Irving Wallace. Irving Wallace? Wait, the famed American author? You mean that actor who went berserk? The same. We're keeping him here while the court reviews his case. Oh yeah, or him. With the exposition over, we stop by to see Irving. But if you guessed he's escaped and left a dead orderly in his bed, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. On the way back, we get this master class in acting. I don't want to hear. That's horrible. This really makes you wonder how she got the lead in the musical. Back inside, David Byrne is telling her she's screwing up a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And before you go, would you clean out your dressing room and give the key to Laurel? Laurel is apparently a really big fan of this. Betty, meanwhile, wanders right into this jump scare. She's ready to head back in, but she runs face first right into this pickaxe. Why, yes, I do see your point. Poor Betty. All her blood will be washed away like tears in the rain. Alicia finds the corpse, then runs back in screaming. <laughs> God, what's going on now? It's Betty! David Byrne is like, look, these theatrics aren't going to get you the lead role. The cops show up and take the body, but you know what they say in showbiz? The show must go on. Lock the door and hide the key. I gotta say, locking the door and hiding the key would be bad advice even if there wasn't a psycho killer running amok. I mean, what if there's a fire? Then he gives a pep talk. And you may ask yourself, how did I get here? Man, my David Byrne sucks. After that, it's time for script rewrites. Mark, give me the script. I want to make some changes. Meanwhile, Sybil's got morning sickness. Only it's evening. Oh, hey, Sting. Sorry to bring this back up, but, you know, I'm pregnant. Meanwhile, Laurel heads off to wardrobe. Why? It's Narnia business. Too bad for her, she's not alone. The one thing an owl can't resist is a nice pair of hooters. She winds up trapped in the closet, but she screams her lungs out. <laughs> Gonna be honest, that was pretty breathtaking. And with order restored, it's time to resume rehearsals. Our killer is ready to make his debut. Monster! You gotta admit, he looks pretty owlsome. And he takes direction well. <laughs> You might have a future in this business. She's like, hey, I know you're a method actor, but this is a bit excessive. He finishes the deed and the crew finally figures it out. Christ, what's the knife got to do with anything? <gasps> That's not a crack! You could say he's a spotted owl. And say what you will about Corinne, but she was clearly willing to die for her art. Anyway, the bad news is there's a killer inside the theater and the phone line's been cut. The good news is the cops are outside. The police car's outside. The worst news? Corinne hid the key and she's not talking. Where's the key? <sighs> I gave it to Corinne. Oh. Outside, Officer McKelly Suave and his partner are on break. Look, it's gonna be hard to direct this movie from the parking lot. I really should get inside. Back inside, everyone heads off to find some candles. Except Paul Sorvino, who's busy gathering up his money. Naturally, he runs right into the killer. Fun fact, Luigi Montefiore, who's 6'9", played the killer in a lot of scenes but wasn't credited. Ferrari thinks he's gonna buy his way out, but our owl has no need for this blood money. David Byrne and Sting are apparently starting a new supergroup. They can call it the Talking Police, or Police Heads. But their first show is interrupted when Ferrari drops in. <laughs> While everyone reconvenes in the dressing room for a cast meeting, General Cole and Al explores the building. After that, David Byrne and Sting start the second leg of their tour. First stop, the basement. 
While they're out, the killer is ready to pick off some victims in the dressing room. Help me, close! The door is blocked, but it's okay. He's just gonna drill Mark. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's gonna kill him with a drill. And just like that, Mark's career in musicals is over. You could say he was a one-bit wonder. Short one crew member, everyone decides to head to the workshop where they arm themselves. Why didn't I think of it before in the workshop? We can find everything we need to defend ourselves. If the owl killer shows up, this could turn into a real hoot nanny. Eventually, David Byrne gets on the lightning rig and spots our killer. Peekaboo! They decide to corner the killer, so everyone heads for the ladders. Too bad Laurel sends Alicia plummeting. Let go of me! She's really a falling star now. And they do find Irving. David Byrne shows us why he's a beloved musician. His axe skills are impeccable. <laughs> but if you guess that's not the killer, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. When the mask finally comes off, it's Giovanni Lombardo Radice. Brett. Brett. It's Brett. Oh, I can't help but feel like he got off easy here. While they're distracted, Al Pacino drags Sybil down through the floor. You could say she's really floored over this development. What ensues is a real tug of war, at least until Sybil goes to pieces. She's literally half the woman she used to be. An enraged Sting doesn't summon the police, he hops down into the hole for Mortal Kombat. If I'm not back in five minutes, send out an SOS. Maybe a message in a bottle or something. It's really unfortunate that no one ever told him that Chainsaw beats Hammer and Rochambeau every time. Learn the rules, Sting. Don't worry, Sting, that's a Black & Decker chainsaw. It'll be dull before it even gets to your spine. At any rate, I guess we'll know the shape of his heart soon enough. Our pal Al Gore isn't done yet, though. David Byrne and Laurel make a break for it, but she gets sawed like a redwood. And then David tries to make a deal. You leave me alone. And I'll leave you alone. Alright? Too bad Irving isn't really into negotiating. Alicia, who's still in this movie, finally wakes up. She's feeling grimy, so she heads for the showers. Unfortunately, she's not going to get clean in here. It's just another bloodbath with a barely alive Laurel. Before she can get answers, the killer shows up. And we get one of the most tense moments in stage fright as Laurel is killed while looking directly at Alicia. That's what you get for trying to take my part. From there, Alicia tries to find the keys, but only manages to find this pistol. Looks like owl hunting season is ready to commence. It's really interesting to note that after doling out multiple gruesome kills, Suave shifts gears in the film's third act, replacing the carnage with genuine suspense as Alicia plays a game of owl and mouse with the killer. Since the killer thinks everyone's dead, he's ready to kick back and relax. But he didn't want to be owl alone, so he's brought his friends to the stage. This is one of my favorite scenes in all of Italian horror. There's just something gruesomely beautiful and cool about this shot. Alicia spots the key. Too bad it's right next to the killer's foot. Luckily for her, Al Roker here is busy with the feather report. The key's stuck, but after some pussyfooting around, she works it free. Alicia's ready to escape, but she backs right into this jump scare. Naturally, the gun is empty, but she's got other options. Nailed it. She's clearly not Jill Valentine with these unlocking skills, so she has to flee further backstage with Irving in pursuit. They square off on the catwalk where Alicia extinguishes his career. Literally. She's beating his fingers and he's like, I'm telling you, that hurts. He's hanging by a thread, or in this case, a cable. But then Alicia Paul Bunyans it and sends him plummeting to his doom. Guess this is one owl who couldn't fly. Then she heads out on stage. You survived. Take a bow. Except you knew Irving wasn't dead, right? <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> Alicia sets him on fire like her last name was Keys and then makes her escape. The next day, she heads back to the theater to recover her watch. My watch. Because, yeah, that seems important. 
When she arrives, she meets up with Danny Glover. Um, why would he be going back to work? This is a crime scene and the cast and crew of the show is dead. Anyway, let's just roll with it. They head inside and really, Danny Glover is kind of a dick. That gun you found wasn't empty, you know. It was loaded all right, only you forgot to take the, the safety off. Yeah, you forgot to take the safety off, silly broad. Man, I wonder if removing the safety is going to be important later. Probably not, right? Danny Glover might just be working his lines for next week's production of Rain Man the Musical here at the theater. Then this happens. They call it the Sound Stage Massacre. Eight horrible mutilated bodies were found at the modern studios this morning as police. This movie is such an homage to showbiz, even the corpses take a curtain call. Irving's about to demonstrate a clever new acting technique, but Danny Glover plugs him right between the eyes. Diplomatic immunity has just been revoked. Man, my Danny Glover sucks too. See that, see that, Ali? Right, right between the eyes. Why do I feel like Danny Glover is going to be telling this story for eternity to anyone who will listen? Well, that's great, Danny. Oh, look at the time. I'd like to hang out and hear more, but I gotta go get my watch fixed. And wait for it. Hmm. Yeah, swerve ending. Why is the killer alive and smiling? Probably because he's not going to get arrested and wind up at Alcatraz. Stage Fright has been one of my all-time favorite slasher films since I first saw it back in the early 90s. The story idea is as simple as they come, but Suave elevates the material in such a way that the film is way better than it has any right to be. You can see that Suave learned a lot working with Argento. Too bad he only made four horror films during the course of his career. One of his kids fell ill and he basically stopped directing for a stretch. When he came back, the Italian horror scene was essentially dead. These days, he makes a lot of Italian television productions, which is a waste of his talents. But enough about that. Can Stage Fright earn a five barf bag standing ovation? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, Stage Fright delivers. We've got a pickaxe to the face, multiple stabbings, axe murder, a decapitation, one person ripped in half, and a drilling. That's more than enough splatter to earn Stage Fright a very respectable four barf bag rating. This one's a sick flick. Looking for more McKelly Suave? Then be sure to check out my review of The Church. You'll find a link here on the screen during my outtakes. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters. <laughs> Stage Fright offers up a masked killer. Fuck. Stage Fright offers up a masked killer. <laughs> masked killer. He's been eating a lot of Trembolone sandwiches, which is making him huge. And Crudus Sean... Crudus. <laughs> Fuck. Sorry, Crudus, that was a typo. I'll give Suave this. It takes balls to open an Italian... Ugh. Here's Brett fulfilling our quota for... Blah, 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 blah. Come on, let's get it together. With the exposition over, we stop by to see Irving. But if you guessed he... Ugh. Man, that voice. Meanwhile, Laurel heads off to the wardrobe. <sighs> oh, so many screw-ups. She winds up trapped in the closet, but there's... Oh, I wish I was trapped in a closet. <laughs> Who knew reading and talking was so difficult? They square off on the catwalk where Alicia extinguishes his... <laughs> Killing your own lines today. Killing your own lines. Suave's all like... <sighs> Suave's all like, maybe you could read your script next time, Mike. Man, life was a lot easier when I just made 10-minute videos without jokes.